thanks for that heads up. Sorry about that. So, where we left off, we basically had united the core of Russia, and we were looking south to expand into the Pontic Steppe. We don't really want to mess around with Poland and Lithuania too much yet. Uh, they're pretty beefy right now, and I really want them to absorb Prussia before I really start doing that, because a loose Prussia can be problematic for pretty much anybody. And it, it got especially more dangerous because uh, oh, Prussia's the only one that has Prussian ideas anymore, but they almost always get formed by Poland these days. Um, Brandenburg is not the threat it used to be. If Brandenburg doesn't get Protestantism, doesn't form Prussia, they aren't as dangerous as they used to be. But now it seems like Poland will almost always vassalize Prussia, uh, and I want them to absorb that. Because I'd rather deal with a, Pol with a beefy Poland than a beefy Prussia, because Prussian space marines, the, the meme is real. I actually had a personal Prussia game going this week, and the Prussian ideas are still ludicrously overpowered. It looks like Denmark is going to get eaten up by uh, Lübeck, though. Uh, they, they sometimes will get like this, but they're looking pretty thick over here. Before I started, I took a look at the rest of the world, and the Congo is actually looking pretty darn strong, so... This is a new event. Okay, so we have the Tatars. We can leave them to their religion, or forcibly convert them. A temporary buff. Uh, what's our patriarch authority at right now? Uh, I will take that patriarch authority and legitimacy. Patriarch authority is another one of the most ludicrously overpowered uh, things in this game. At full patriarch authority, you get missionary strength, less local unrest, and more manpower, which is always useful as Russia. Let's see what's going on down here. I mean, we could honestly just start obliterating them right now. What's our tech at? All right, let's let's get tech ten before we start really conquering everything, because then we can start getting the Siberian frontiers going. For lucky, Sweden will get its independence from Denmark, and that'll divide the uh, northern states, but I don't see that happening as much lately. Sometime in the past few patches, Sweden d just doesn't get its independence anymore. It used to always. But it looks like Denmark managed to absorb the Baltic, so they should still be able to absorb both Norway and Sweden, even if they lost Schleswig. Hungary is still going strong, although, they, yep, they're under a union. What's Bohemia doing? Alright, so Austria is going to be pretty strong. We might want to ally them. Or did we ally them? No, we didn't, but we might want to. Alright, I can afford it, so let's take it. And historically, actually, Russia and Austria... We're on and off allies, sort of frenemies, I guess, but uh, that, that changed with the rise of Germany, but throughout most of modern, the, the modern, early modern period, uh, Russia and Austria were allies, and it, it makes sense. They had a s common enemy in Poland, Lithuania, and their goals weren't really that 
d disparate, the, the goals weren't really overlapping. Um, at least until Russia started bordering Austria-Hungary. But they both had a common enemy in the Ottomans, and Austria mostly wanted to expand southward rather than eastward. All right, and if we're because we're Russia, we'll probably want to take trade ideas because if you can get the whole Trans-Siberian trade network going, then you are going to be rolling in money by the late game. And we should be able to form Russia. Get those new ideas. And there we go. We got a much better map color. I, I think uh, of the green countries in this game, Russia has the best green. Italy is kind of like a like a puke green, and the Ottomans are just... The Ottomans have a gross color. They should have gone with red or something like that. Going to go with the Paradox missions. Theodoro does not want to be our friend anymore. And this is another thing. So, when Constantinople fell, the Russian Orthodox Church was the last powerful Orthodox Church standing. Um, there really were no other nations in the world that had a strong... Well, they were Orthodox, but they weren't strong. Um, so, a lot of people looked to Moscow as the third Rome, a successor to Constantinople. And that's where Russia's claim as being the third Rome really comes in. So, we want to leave Constantinople to the Turks for now. We'll take leading the true faith from Moscow. And actually, now that we're Russia, we have more governing capacity as well, so we can start stating some stuff. That'll also make converting it a lot easier. And all of this, we're going to control all these states eventually, so... We'll just... Get it done now. Okay, I can take below zero two. All right, there we go. Then we have to core that a second time, but to start. And as Russia, you're not going to want to mess around with your navy for most of the game. Um, it's only really worth building a navy once you get a significant amount of coastline on the Black Sea or the Baltic. Uh, until that point, there's only so much damage uh, naval power can actually do to you. Alright, so we'll have to deal with the Uzbeks, but much like the other Horde nations, they aren't much of a threat to the more established, uh, developed powers. We don't want to make St. Petersburg the capital yet, that would make it too vulnerable. And besides, that didn't happen historically until the 18th century. We'll take that missionary strength, though, and... yep. So yeah, this was just kind of a swamp for most of Russian history. But in the 18th century, Peter the Great wanted to westernize Russia, to become a European power. And Moscow was a, always the administrative center of Russia, but it was pretty far east. So he moved the capital here, to St. Petersburg, on the Gulf of Finland, to bring it closer to the west. He also built Russia's first navy. Oh, and this is the other good part about playing Russia. We have claims on all of this. And I believe they're permanent claims, so we don't ever have to worry about those running out. So, we can get Theodoro in this. But, uh, at 7,000 men, I'll take it. Let's get them in. And we want to take Astrakhan to stop the Ottomans from taking it, because they will if you let them get out of hand. They're going to break through, inevitably. They're going to start sieging stuff, but we don't really have to worry about that.
you know, it, it, it it's just too much of a pain to really chase them through all of Russia. And, eh, the attrition will get to them eventually. Plus, the sieges go very fast, because we have artillery. Going to be losing money, that's just... Early early game wars are difficult because your economy is pretty limited in what it can actually support. All right, and Theodora will help us. That's that's really the advantage of having smaller allies and satellite states is they'll take care of all the non-fortified provinces for you. Going to send this army back to deal with the uh, small stack at Novgorod. And I mean, before Moscow, Novgorod was the administrative center of Russia. That was the city founded by Rurik of Dorstadt when he came to rule the Kievan Rus. Um, it's got one of the oldest preserved castles in Russia. Which is, I, I would very much like to go and see Russia. It's used to be able to speak a few phrases in the language. Russian culture is fascinating because it's this... it's always kind of been this hybrid between East and West. Um, for example, patronymics. You don't really get them in a lot of European languages. Um, the Norsemen have them, which could be where they came from. They could also have come from uh, Eastern peoples the Russians had contact with, but uh, patronymics are like um, so, like say your name's Ivan and your father's name was Pavel, you'd be Ivan Pavlovich or Ivan son of Pavel. And what I would like is to take a couple provinces off of the Uzbeks so I can just I can start doing using the Siberian frontiers a bit more effectively. Yeah, these are some of the easiest wars you have to fight as Russia. These, the, the steppe nomads do not put up much of a fight. And, I mean, once Russia unified historically, it, it, it was over pretty quick for the last uh, successor states of the Mongols. And we just got a fur province in one of our uh, Siberian expansions, and that was another big part of Russian industry in this period. So the French went to Canada for furs, but the Russians had huge, huge hunting grounds in Siberia. So they didn't need to go to the New World for them, and it was a lot easier to ship them to Europe from Russia than across the ocean. So until the French really get going, Russia dominates the fur trade in Europe. Alright, they're pretty much done. I just want to see if I can grab this province over here, too. That's... I can't see right now. But... Go deal with the last of them. 100 Chapter Synod. In 1551, Metropolitan Mascarius convened the church in what became known as the 100 Chapter Synod in order to unify church ceremonies and duties all over Russia. They also demanded that the government cancel its jurisdiction over the church. And that actually harkens back to a very, very old concept in both Rome and the Byzantine Empire, where it was the concept of Caesar-opapism, or 
the Caesar over the Pope? Who is the dominant power, basically, or who has control over the other? And in the West, the Pope was the last thing standing, the last vestige of the Western Empire. So he was going to be damned if some jackass in Constantinople was going to tell him what to do. Meanwhile, the Patriarch in Constantinople was second fiddle to the Emperor. So in the East, the state usually had control over the church. And in the West, the church had a lot of influence over secular states. Although, for most of medieval history, the church and the state were one and the same, and we're going to take that patriarch authority, because we might be able to get a, an icon. Yep, we can grab an icon. I'll take manpower recovery and discipline, because we're at war. And that that is part of what makes Russia as ridiculously powerful as it is in this game. Take our next religious idea. Because at any given time, you can basically make your religion give you any buff you want. And plus 5 discipline, plus 10 manpower recovery is pretty damn good. Especially because you don't have to do anything to get Patriarch Authority. It just comes to you via event throughout the whole game. I know you want to surrender, but I want more land. That's the thing. If you play Russia, you really get into the mindset of uh, <laughs> Russia's borders are the oceans. Expand endlessly. <laughs> Alright. Oh, we got rebels. That's actually pretty good for us. Yeah, if you leave land occupied for too long, you will eventually get rebels in it. Alright, looks like Uzbek is getting eaten by Kazan, which makes things easier. Deliberative uh, Assembly, what else but Royal Decree? There's only one Tsar, there's only one God. And actually, that was something that went back to... Well, during the Byzantine Empire, it was sort of... There's one, in their mind, there is one god in heaven, and so there must be one emperor on earth. And the Russians inherited that idea. The Tsar was the absolute monarch of Russia because the imperial government was supposed to imitate God's court in heaven. That was the idea, at least. Just need one more province. There we go. I mean, ultimately, the absolutism came and bit the Tsar in the ass during the uh, revolution. But it helped keep Russia together throughout most of its history. All right, we can grab pretty much everything we want, so I'll take that now. That coalition, I don't care. It's a coalition of weak states. Won't be a problem. One thing you do have to watch as Russia is your overextension. Because when you're taking the vast quantities of land that you will be taking as Russia, you can very easily overextend yourself. Right now we're fine. We're at, I, let me check again, 19%. So we can take a bunch more land during this war. We want to get down to Astrakhan. That will get us a coalition, but whatever. Can still fight all those at once. It'll also completely bisect the uh, Golden Horde. Yeah, as long as the Ottomans aren't hopping in on this coalition... Actually, you know what? I will take gold instead. Yeah, it can be a problem if they get in. 
but otherwise it's Russia. There isn't a whole lot anyone can really do to stop you. Um, in the East, the only state that can really match you is the Ottomans. And they kind of stop being a problem in the uh, 18th century because they get a bunch of debuffs. At least they used to. I don't... I, 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 this, I'm getting back into this game for the past few weeks um, after a long time of not playing. Yeah, starting this stream was getting back into EU4 for me. Uh, once this Russia game is done, I might do some Hearts of Iron 4, or maybe some Crusader Kings 3. Uh, those are all fun, but very different. That is interesting. You don't usually see those native revolts as Russia. Uh, I apologize for the border core <laughs> um, down here with the Great Horde. But eventually they'll get rebels, and if we're lucky, they'll splinter into several different states, which will allow us to conquer faster. More permanent claims. Always nice. What are we behind? Yeah, we're behind in pretty much everything, but we're fine. We're fine. We'll catch up. Repay that loan. Take that fur. We're losing money, but only because we are. Oh, this is a this is a fun mod I have on that gives you random events that are kind of flavor. So we're gonna give people buns. Everybody gets buns. Let them eat buns. Uh, we're gonna have some rebels. That's just gonna kind of be a constant in this game particularists. They're not a particularly bad kind of rebel. Separatists are horrible, but it gets worse. It, 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 the uh, particularists are not that bad. They, they just raise autonomy if they succeed. Which is a pain, but it could be worse. And where are they going to show up? Eh, could be any of these. Spread this army out. You guys go up to Zaritsyn, which is now Volgograd, but you probably know it as uh, Stalingrad, which is what it was during World War II. But no, during the time of the Tsars, it was called Zaritsyn. All right, now we can focus on teching up, which we should at least do once or twice more before we really keep going eastward. Oh, there we go. The uh, Uzbeks are starting to splinter. This will this will get easy. The worst thing that can happen would be for one of these Siberian tribes to uh, become a tributary state of China. Because they're one of the only other nations that can actually challenge Russia. Um, once Russia gets going, gets its full manpower capabilities going, there aren't many that actually can... Even Prussia can get overwhelmed by Russia's manpower. But China is one of the only countries that can go pound for pound with Russia in terms of excessive manpower. Wait, these are some interesting looking rebels <laughs> for a Muslim city. <laughs> Got the Jerusalem cross. I don't know what they are. I do have uh, a unit uh, unit mod on. Uh, we're not going to state any of that just yet. Uh, we don't want that. That actually kind of works out for us. It will trigger those rebels faster. Uh, I'll take that. Free development is always nice. Even if you're a big country like Russia, you're, you're going to have plenty of development by the end game. But if it's free, take it. 
And if we switch to trade grids, you'll see pretty much all of this is, uh, is fur. And that was part of what drove the Russians into Siberia, was, weirdly enough, fur. Um, once the European beaver was depleted, which there is actually an event for it in this game, um, Europe was eager for new sources, and Russia had the vast emptiness of Siberia behind it, filled with animals ripe for the hunting. And that's exactly what they did. Um, it was only later that they discovered huge amounts of gold, iron, and other natural resources out there aside from fur. And now, of course, it's the uh, vast oil and natural gas reserves in Siberia. Uh, we're going to be a little while on those loans, because when you, when you take new land, it, it does bite into your taxes. Can't really afford any of them right yet. And really, as Russia, all you're going to do is uh, set your national focus to admin and just let it go, because with the sheer amount of things you're conquering, you are going to need all of that admin. And this is the point of the game where you start seeing Russia getting real thick. Yeah, we got one loan. It's it's not terrible. All right, got those rebels, and now we just got the Kazani separatists, and we can continue focusing on consolidation. But at the very least, we stopped the Ottomans on the Pontic Steppe. They won't be able to get past us. So all of this has now been cordoned off for us to conquer, and the Timurids are still around. Usually, they collapse pretty early in the game. Uh, yeah, colonialism is the one that really gets Russia, because it almost always spawns in Spain, France, or England, and France is getting their ass kicked by Spain. Holy crap. Anyway, colonialism almost always spawns somewhere out in Western Europe, and it takes it forever to work its way out to Russia. Even the printing press will get to you faster as Russia. There we go. I think up next we will take Kazan and expand to the Volga. Awesome. They're the Great Horde's problem now. Yeah, I'll let them fight it. we get? Yeah, we can actually have four leaders, which will allow us to train everything and keep our forces relatively spread out, which is what we need for consolidation. There we go. Because of the number of battles you fight as Russia, you do tend to have pretty good army tradition. Oh, and there we go. That is... Well, that was interesting. Never seen that happen before. Oh well, we can now kind of start seeing into Asia. We're eventually going to get all the way out here, into eastern Siberia. Uh, I don't care about you, Oirat. Sometimes you're a Ming... Damn it, they're a Ming tributary. That's going to be painful. We might be lucky and get uh, Ming Plosion, which I've seen happening a lot more often, but uh, not as often as I'd like. I'm I'm hoping that Ming just just dies before we get over there. If we uh, and Oirat is huge is the other problem, but they are allied with Kazan, so we might be able to take we're going to be able to take advantage of that. And historically, these nations out here were often in the orbit of China. Um, it was only later, once Russia expanded into Siberia, that they be usually got incorporated into the Russian Empire. But um, the Mongols did rule China for quite a while, and 
afterwards, they subjugated all of the states that succeeded the uh, their one-time oppressors. But there's this interesting thing that happens with China historically, where conquerors um, become Chinese. Like um, it happened with the Mongols and later with the Manchu, where this foreign people invaded but they didn't replace Chinese culture with their own. They adopted it and effectively became Chinese themselves. Um, a similar thing happened during the Islamic expansion in the Middle East, where they conquer Persia, but Persia conquers them in, in a way. Um, I don't have the admin to take that, so I'll just take those rebels and send some men up to deal with them. Anyway, so yeah, the, the Muslims conquered Persia um, fully, but they um, weren't able to subjugate it and force it to adopt Arab culture in the same way they had done many other parts of the Middle East. Because Persia was such an old cultural powerhouse. And it's the same idea with China throughout its history, where plenty of people have conquered China but they adopted Chinese culture after the fact. Yeah, we're going to have to take advantage of the alliance between Oirat and Kazan to start gobbling Oirat up, because we do not want to let the Chinese get this far into our sphere of influence. Now, historically, Russia and China were actually pretty good friends in this period. Um, in fact, Russia got the good tea from China, and I'm not talking about gossip. Um, the Chinese had tea for their own consumption. That was what they exported out to friends and allies. So if you bought tea from China and you weren't a friend or ally, you got the crappy stuff. But the Russians got blocks of the finest Chinese black tea exported across Siberia to them. And that's a big part of why Russia is a tea culture, not a coffee culture. It's funny, if you look at a map of Europe, the only two places that have a tea culture rather than a coffee culture are Russia and Great Britain. One of the one of the very few connections between those countries. All right, we got we got to catch up, but we won't really be able to until we get colonialism, which is slowly coming. Austria lost great power status. I still got Hungary as a as a union. Huh. Looks like Poland is getting screwed by the Ottomans, which that's usually what happens. These Ottomans are going to be a problem for me to deal with, I can already tell, because um, they're almost through eating up the Mamluks, and they have the most valuable part of Egypt right here. Um, can't imagine anything would stop them from expanding south into Elodia and Ethiopia. Though historically, the Mamluks, or the, uh, the Ottomans, were never able to conquer Ethiopia. Um, simply too mountainous. Uh, yeah, let's burn some heretics. Um, but no, Ethiopia remained unconquered throughout its history because of its mountainous terrain. It, if you've ever seen landscapes of Ethiopia, it is the polar opposite of a place like Russia or Poland. It is all mountains. It's like Afghanistan. It's impossible to fight through it, especially if the people you're fighting know those mountains well. We'll take that prestige. Thank you very much. One thing I like about the Russian ideas is they gave them some artillery. They gave them a boost to artillery, um, mostly because the foundries at Smolensk, which is currently under the control of the Lithuanians, but we'll, we'll get it back. They also converted it, which is going to be a problem. But uh, So we've got all of that. So we can probably start converting this land. 
which will help us out. And we should be able to take... Um, oh, we have Defender of the Faith. All right, good. Um, Defender of the Faith really benefits you if you have a lot of religions following it, but the extra missionary is nice as Russia. And, he, and he, because you're probably... In all likelihood, you're going to be the only Orthodox nation, it is nice to have the extra missionary, and that's the minimum you get for being Defender of the Faith. All right, it looks like Kazan is going to absorb a good chunk of the Great Horde here. But this is good. We can actually get to Azov quicker than Russia did historically. Historically, Russia didn't expand much here until the 18th century, under the reign of Catherine the Great, um, when they took the port of Azov from the Ottomans. Or rather, Crimea, which was a satellite of the Ottomans, right? So... This was kind of off-limits, because the Ottomans were, were a real pain in the ass for Russia to deal with historically, too. Um, although these Ottomans, uh, they didn't get much control up here, so... Are these guys... No, they're a tributary of the Great Horde, so we should be able to get access to the Black Sea much faster than historical Russia. Now, the funny thing is, as you're expanding into Siberia, a lot of these states tend to ally some of the bigger players in India, which can make fighting them a real pain in the ass, because you have to hoof it all the way from Central Asia to India, and sometimes there's a big nasty Persia in the way that will stop you. Hi there, I'm Batman. Good to see you. Um, I'm going to be doing a stream with him on Tuesday. Um, it's a multiplayer stream. Um, don't quite know who I will be playing as, but, uh, probably won't be Russia. I'm, I'm kind of, this game is going to satisfy my Russia playthrough. Uh, Russia, Russia is, is, it's not for people who like to play tall. It's, it's the polar opposite of playing tall. Um, if you like map painting, though, there aren't, and there's no better country, except for maybe the Ottomans in France, but... I've never done a World Conquest run, but if I was doing it, it would be Russia, the Ottomans, or France. So yeah, once, as Russia, once you get out east, what you're going to want to do is establish a border with China, and then refuse to become its tributary. Um, that will just completely destroy their mandate, which historically the mandate of heaven was a concept. The uh, oh yeah, England is great uh, for for tall play. Um, Prussia can also be good for it. They're, the mechanics of the Prussian government really lend themselves to playing tall. Um, but uh, anyway, once if you're Russia, once you get out east. You want to get a border with China, because if China has a large state on their border that isn't a tributary, they slowly will lose the mandate of heaven. But, uh, and I mean, I studied Chinese history in college. That was my, my specialty was East Asia. And the mandate of heaven is this interesting concept in Chinese government. I mean, to, to a degree, the, the communists today still kind of have to play with it. The idea is very deep, deeply ingrained in Chinese culture, where if a country, if, if a government loses the mandate, it, 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 basically when a country loses the mandate, China falls into chaos. So it's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy. When a Chinese dynasty starts losing control of the situation, the people think they've lost the mandate. This makes them lose it more. Oh, uh, I must have missed that in the patch notes. Well, that's that's a shame. It used to be a lot easier to deal with China. Oh well, I should still have a tech advantage on them when I finally get over there, so should be able to deal with them. But uh, so the mandate: once a Chinese government has lost the mandate, the people lose faith in that government. Usually, the the, uh, the idea starts to spread. And this ultimately allows a new dynasty to come to power. Now, what you see happen throughout Chinese history 
is this sort of dynastic cycle where you have a short-lived dynasty so you have a short-lived giant dynasty that conquers and unites all of China that is replaced by a more longer-lived China um, so the first time this plays out is the the Qin dynasty very short-lived very brutal very militaristic they get replaced by the Han dynasty who are much more relaxed and the Han rule for about 400 years. Yeah, I was training my men. Probably shouldn't have done. Um, but there's a fortress there. So, once the Han rule, when the Han collapse, China falls into a bunch of different warring states. And you have several different warring states periods throughout Chinese history. But it starts to cycle over again. Eventually, one of those states starts to consolidate power. And once they do, they unite the rest of China, and usually it's a very militaristic dynasty. Well, they don't like militaristic dynasties in China, so they usually get overthrown. And the cycle begins again. And you can watch this play out most pronounced with the Qin, the Han, and then the First Warring States period, which is also called the Spring and, spring and Autumn period, and it was when uh, Sun Tzu wrote The Art of War, which is still a very good uh, guidebook to how to fight a war. A lot, of, a lot of the advice Sun Tzu has is still very much applicable. Um, and then you can see it again with the... Uh, I am blanking on the dynasty that came before the Tang, but they were a short-lived militaristic dynasty. He was replaced by the Tang, who were cultural powerhouses. Um, during the Tang dynasty is when China has a huge artistic renaissance, and a lot of the classic literature of Chinese culture is written during the Tang dynasty, which roughly correlates to the uh, 7th to the 11th centuries in Europe. Um, it was the Tong who encountered the uh, the Muslims and fought them. I'm blanking on the name of the battle, but it was a battle right out here on the distant border of China. Uh, the Muslims were trying to push past Central Asia into China. Alright, I think I'm going to take out some loans because I'm already 50% behind here. One more out of work. Uh, but, uh, interesting that you should mention... Okay, so... The Ming, Han, and Qing are the three best known. But, the Tong don't get enough credit. Um, if you, if you, if you want an interesting period to study in Chinese history, go for the Tong Dynasty. They were my favorite. Um... That's also when you get a lot of these really prominent scientists emerging in China. That's they, a lot of great architecture happens then too. They expand the Great Wall, which was originally built by the Qin, and it was much smaller. Um, and the thing is, the Great Wall was not built all at once. It was a successive building project, and the current pro the current wall you see was built by the Ming Dynasty, who were another one of China's greatest dynasties. And the Ming are interesting because they went exploring outside of China, and you get a uh, really great explorer called uh, Zhong He, who, if I remember his name right, Zhong He, who was a eunuch and a Muslim who sailed a treasure fleet all around the Indian Ocean and Pacific. And he may have gotten to the west coast of what is now the United States because we have find we archaeologists have found Ming Dynasty coins dating back to that period in California. The only way they could have gotten there is if Zhong Ha got lost and accidentally found his way to the Americas. See th that theory is actually it's. If they did, it would be a bit like how the Vikings technically discovered Canada. They just weren't able to stay here. Um, so there is evidence that the Chinese might have accidentally 
stumbled into North America, much like the Vikings just accidentally found Canada. Um, they just did not make any lasting colony. Um, more than likely, if it did happen, Zwangha... I mean, that could happen, but these were found a bit inland, so in all likelihood what happened was a part of the Chinese treasure fleet got thrown aside in a storm, got lost, and probably lost a few things along the coast, and then eventually found their way back to China. Um, I mean, again, nobody in the old world knew there was a new world, so they probably just thought they'd wound up on somewhere in India, maybe. Um, but un unlike the, uh, the, the Vikings, the Chinese never attempted to build a colony. The Vikings did try. They were just unsuccessful. Um, part of the problem there is they did not have the technology or the manpower to be constantly sending voyages over. Uh, yes, I will let them go out and do their thing. Um, so that was another thing that happened during this period is um, individual families would, at the behest of the Tsar, get some funding. <laughs> um, they would, oh, yeah, they actually they might have done. I mean, they, the, uh, that's another interesting thing about both China and Rome is they knew, they both knew there was some other great power on the other side of the world that was too far away to really get in contact with. Um, they usually had heard about the other through the Persians. Um, and there maybe was a, an accidental military encounter between a Roman legion and a Chinese army, but there's not a whole lot of evidence for that. Um, it, it largely stems from one written account from China where they describe soldiers using what he describes as a fish scale formation, which sounds a little bit like what uh, the Romans would have used in a, in a testudo formation, which is uh, when, a, when you're approaching under arrow fire, the men would form basically a giant box with their shields to deflect them. Um, but there are written accounts of there were two Roman explorers who at one point found their way to China. Um, that is true. The, the Chinese knew of Rome, and they probably learned some Latin through the Persians, um, or maybe Marco Polo. Because um, by the time the British got there, Marco Polo had already spent a lot of time at the court of the... Uh, well, he, he thought he was in China. He was technically in the Mongol Empire, and he saw the Yuan Dynasty. Or Marco Polo was a lunatic liar. Take your pick. Um, he might have gone to Mongolia, or he might have made the whole thing up. We really don't know. I lean towards that he actually got there. The Venetians got around. Those, those Italian merchants. Alright, we have kind of a crappy king. Um, well, we do not want that to happen. Uh, well, it might happen. That's fun. Um, yes, he met Kublai Khan, who, I, if I remember right, was Genghis Khan's grandson. Alright, we do not want this to happen. How can I avoid the time of troubles? I think it's because our monarch has one zero, so this, this should be fun. He didn't hear of him in Europe, but if Marco Polo is to be believed, he did find his way to the court of Kublai Khan on his own. Um, no, the uh, they knew of a few of the Khans in Europe at this point. Like, um, Batu Khan was the one most Europeans would have heard of, because he was the first Mongol to make an incursion into Europe when he attacked the Russians. Okay, we got that to go away, I think. All right, progress is zero. We're good. We do not want the time of troubles to happen. Historically, that almost destroyed Russia. 
There almost wasn't a Russia. Um, if it hadn't been for the Romanov dynasty, there might not have been. Uh, really, uh, the Time of Troubles was horrible. The, the Russians gave it kind of a mild name, but... <laughs> Uh, it's sort of like with the uh, with the Northern Irish referred to as the Troubles. Um, people were getting car bombed and there were terrorist attacks, but it was just the, the Troubles, you know. It happens every now and again. The, the entire again Russia, the entire country was falling apart. Is the Troubles? I'll take that loyalty hit from the boyars. There are the great horde separatists. Okay. All right, with the Time of Troubles temporarily averted, we might be able to... At some point, that goes away. Like, it no longer is a threat for you. I think if you get through the Age of Reformation without it firing, you're fine. Okay. Chagtai and Oirat. We can take them. Our manpower is fully restored. That's our tech. I'll take that prestige hit. Um, what, are, what are your military techs at? Okay, Kazan is on par with us. But we have him on manpower and resources, so we should be fine. Oh, and even better, Chagtai won't join. Where's R. Kelly? There it is. Alright. Here we go. Time to conquer more horse nomads. I mean, I realize that there was only so many ways they could portray a nomadic population in this game, but the way, the way it looks, it looks like these are some kind of an organized state out here, like Kazan. In reality, they weren't. These are just lands that were controlled by a, uh, a tribe of nomads. Um, a lot of it was empty because the nomads moved around. They didn't have permanent settlements. So the Russians had to defeat them in battles. All right, we just got Timofeyevich as an explorer. Um, let's see. Probably put him in charge of one of my armies. One of the one stars. Yes, I will probably start doing that. I was waiting for the Commonwealth to uh, absorb Prussia, because I don't want Prussia getting loose. I would much rather have them just absorbed by Poland, so I don't have to worry about fighting them. So who are you allied with? Okay, they have France as an ally, so maybe maybe we hold off on that. Um, this is what happened to me in the last Russia game. I... Uh, Poland had some beefy allies, so I had to expand into Asia to be able to fight them. I needed to get that development so I could field a large enough army to fight them all at once. And France was almost constantly the defender of the faith uh, for Catholicism, so every time I tried expanding into Catholic Europe, I had to fight the French. I would not have been able to do that if I hadn't. Oh, I know. Right now, right now, the bigger problem is that they, they have France. But France is a little bit weak this game. So once I've dealt with these tribes to my south, I will probably start expanding into Europe and just finish up colonizing Siberia. Yeah, we don't, we don't really have to worry about the, the Oirat getting out here. Sabir, what are you guys doing? Alright, they're a tributary, but they might be able to break out once I've uh, absorbed a good chunk of Kazan. Uh, 
Uh, that is usually my goal with these Russia games, is to get to the absolute peak of Russian territory, which was 1914. Um, and maybe even a little bit beyond. If uh, I Usually, if I can, I will try to take uh, Constantinople. Okay, the Tibetans are involved in this. I don't know why. Or did you guys drag China in? Okay, good. No, they didn't drag China in. I'm not ready to fight them yet. Uh, China is an interesting country to play in this game, because they start powerful, and you kind of have to manage losing ground. Because you're going to be behind in tech, you're going to be behind in institutions, more so than pretty much anybody else. So, you start as a major power. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, I think uh, I, have, I have a mod on that kind of fixes that. Um, it, it fixes the Eastern German border to make it more aesthetic. Um, I, I never liked... They made it worse with uh, one of the more recent patches. But it used to be if you, f you had this perfect East German border except for this one little bit. Well, yeah, historically that's what happened. Um, but in this game, if you're China, you, you have to kind of work within the... Uh, fact that you're going to be behind in everything. Um, actually, one of my favorite examples of that were the, was the Boxer Rebellion, where a bunch of people following a guy who... This is where it gets really weird. He claimed that he was Jesus' descendant or brother or something along those lines. They eschewed um, any kind of weapons, thinking that the ancestral gods of China would protect them, and they proceeded to attack Western militaries with with melee weapons and sticks and their fists. And that's, well, that's why it became the Boxer Rebellion. Um, but that did not work out well, as you can probably imagine. I might be mixing up two of them, but I know the Boxers definitely used their fists. Um... That, that was the one that the U.S. and a bunch of other European powers got involved and put down. It also briefly gave Austria-Hungary a colonial empire. Yeah, it was pretty much every European power got in to uh, attack China at once. If I remember right, it was the UK, France, the US, Germany, Russia, and Austria-Hungary. And briefly, Austria-Hungary had a colonial empire in China. Um, they controlled a part of, I believe it was Shanghai. Let me see if I can absorb some of Oirat here. I can't yet. How much could I take, though? Alright, if I can, I will. I'm going to have to take their capital anyway. Yeah, China was a mess during the late Qing. Yeah, they had like a very tiny part of the city. It was It's hilarious. It's the only time Austria-Hungary held any amount of territory outside of Europe. Closest they ever got to a colonial empire. That said, Austria-Hungary... Their geography didn't really lend itself to having one. And given how internally divided Austria-Hungary was among its various ethnicities, they really would not have been able to maintain a colonial empire for very long, in all honesty. They were... They were... Once you get to the 18th, 19th century... It's, it's, it's honestly between them and the Ottomans, who was the weaker shadow of their former self. Yeah, they... Austria-Hungary was never, ever going to be a naval power. <laughs> they, have, they have an even worse coastline than Russia. Um, 
you have you only have access to this very tiny tiny part of the Adriat of the Mediterranean in the Adriatic that Italy dominated because Italy had a much stronger fleet though Austria-Hungary did have a submarine fleet during World War 1 believe it or not and if you've ever seen the sound of music the uh one of the von Trapps served in Austria-Hungary's uh submarine units I'll take both of those reforms. Thank you very much. Uh, there's a book about him. Yeah, I mean, you really don't have any choice as Italy but to be a powerful navy. I mean, geographically, Italy Italy is very good in terms of your geography for a war. Um, as long as you control most of the passes through the Alps, the only way anyone's getting at you is if they overwhelm your navy. Uh, which is what happened in World War II. The, the Italians... For all his goofiness, Mussolini did manage to build a pretty sizable fleet for the Italians. <laughs> I'm glad that one is still a classic. Um, but no, for, for as goofy as he was, and Mussolini is pretty easy to laugh at these days, um, he did manage to build a pretty sizable fleet that rivaled Britain's Mediterranean fleet. Um, so they were able to... I mean, also, yeah, uh, in this game, Italy is one of the most overpowered countries in the game, because if you can form it, you control two trade end nodes. Um, but no, uh, Mussolini's Mediterranean fleet was a significant threat to the British, and a big, it was honestly a big part of why Italy aligned with um, Germany and Austria. Well, yeah, that was... Incompetence was the name of the game for the Italian army. Um, their navy was much better run, but still not great. But of the powers that could have... The Italian Navy was larger than the Kriegsmarine in World War II, um, and more technologically advanced in a lot of ways. Uh, they just couldn't once once the uh, British Navy really got going. There wasn't there wasn't there wasn't a whole lot they could do about it. And I've neglected things over here, which is my bad mistake. But it looks like Oirat is almost dealt with. They are big. Where are you guys going? Yeah, they they were poorly run, but they they had a sizable fleet at the start of the war. Um, Like, they had a lot of resources, and they didn't use them effectively, which is all on them. I mean, it's a good thing they didn't, really. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, Italy... Italy was the weakest link of the Axis powers. I did have a teacher in middle school whose parents grew up in Mussolini's Italy. And they remember, they believe were from Sicily, and they remembered the uh, Allies invading, um, which was wild. Um, they were in Sicily when uh, Patton showed up and started chasing Erwin Rommel through the streets of uh, Italian cities in a jeep. <laughs> that, yeah. That's that's pretty sad when the when the Hungarians are outdoing you a country that was completely under the completely under the control of another um, throughout the whole of World War One and Two. And it, it, Hungary was technically independent, but they were very much in the German sphere during World War Two. Yeah, the Oirat overextended me a little bit here. It'll be fine. 
That said, World War One, there was a lot of there was a lot of poor performance from every player there. Um, the Russians did horribly in World War One. What are these rebels? Jeez. Just like I'm doing horribly now. Alright, I'll pull those two together. Oirat is huge! How did they get this big? One thing about Russia campaigns is it takes forever to move. Unite these two. Alright, now let's go deal with them. We still got boatloads of manpower, so this this is not a problem. If you're Russia, once you get going, you can pretty much take infinite losses. <laughs> yes, that was another thing. Most of the... Uh, there were plenty of European observers who showed up to look at what was going on during the Civil War, the American Civil War. Um, but they mostly thought it was just these primitive colonials not fighting like gentlemen. When in reality, the Civil War, you see some of the first small squad tactics, you see cavalry losing its effectiveness, you see very primitive machine guns in the form of the Gatling gun. Um, you see rifling first showing up en in, in, in masse. It was one of the first wars not fought with smoothbore muskets. Um, the mini ball makes it even worse. The development of the conical bullet really just that was part of why the Civil War was such a huge bloodbath. Um, you also see the use of some ambush tactics on the part of the Confederacy, largely. Um, uh, and you, you also see the rise of armored warships using coal-fired engines uh, in the form of the, the ironclads, like the uh, Merrimack, and there was another famous one, and the Monitor. Um, theirs was actually the first battle between armored warships. Started the It started the whole era of a... Uh, the mini-ball was the first conical bullet. It was developed by a guy in France, and uh, it, just imagine a bullet minus the casing. It was That was basically it. And it, load, it could be loaded into any uh, muzzle-loading rifle. Also, yes. Um, but no, so the, the mini-ball could be loaded into any smoothbore rifle, or rifled rifle, and the accuracy of a, a smoothbore musket firing a ball, roughly 1 in 32 of those was going to hit its intended target, but if you loaded that same smoothbore musket with a mini-ball, 1 in 5 hit, and if you loaded a rifled uh, gun with a mini-ball, it was 1 to 1 accuracy, largely. Um... That's part of why it was so brutal. And another problem was the surgeons knew how to treat injuries sustained by uh, musket balls, but they didn't know how to treat injuries caused by these new conical bullets, which had this nasty tendency to, once they hit the target, um, tumble. And they would almost hit you and then go straight down through, <laughs> through your chest cavity or your stomach, which just ripped you up inside. Um, it was it was a brutal, brutal weapon, and the Civil War was one of the first times it was actually used. Uh, yes, old the, we at that point we were the the Civil War was largely fought using Napoleonic tactics, at least in the early days. Um, so they would line up across from each other like armies from the West had done for quite a long time and just take shots at one another, and that didn't go well, to say the very least. Alright, I think that's all I'm getting out of them. That was my fault. I, got, I think I got a little carried away talking about history on that one. Um, that's why I came here, not for gameplay, for history. Um, so, old tactics uh, plus new technology equals a disaster for everybody involved, usually. Um, 
other innovations from the era. Yeah, no, it was... Napoleonic tactics worked great when only one out of every 32 bullets fired would actually hit its intended target. Um, your losses wouldn't be that severe, and the only way to make those old guns useful was by firing them in large, like, en masse at a target. Um, I'm not gonna fight that war. Uh, we have a new, new czar. Um, so that worked well when your guns were horribly inaccurate. But once you start getting basically modern accuracy out of out of your firearms, um, that tactic is a bloodbath. It's horrible. And that's part of why the Civil War was such a mess. Another thing about the Civil War that no one realizes is it was the first war that had a lot of media exposure. Um, it was through the newspapers, not the TV, but sort of how Vietnam was the first televised war, the Civil War was the first newspaper war. It was the first war that was widely reported on. And it was one of the first wars where civilians got to see the aftermath of the battles. There were a lot of military photographers during the Civil War who would go to the aftermath of horrible battles like Antietam and Gettysburg and photograph what was left. Yes, the only problem there is that rifles were rather expensive. Um, the main re so part of the problem with military arms is new technology is often expensive, and when you have to outfit thousands of men with a standardized weapon, um, you're going to go for what gets the job done the cheapest. Uh, rifles at that point were it was fairly new technology. It was expensive technology. Um, so you did see small skirmisher units equipped with um, rifles, but it was not financially practical to outfit an entire army with them. Um, so typically what they would do is they would outfit their, their best marksmen with, uh, with rifles and use them as a screening force for the main body of the army. But by the time of the Civil War, that technology had gotten cheaper, so rifles were much more more widespread. That said, a lot of smoothbore muskets were still in use, because neither the Confederacy nor the Union could build the number of rifles they needed. So a lot of mu muskets that had been in service probably since the War of 1812 got dusted off and used in the Civil War. I mean, they still got the job done. Uh, they would used in line tactics, they would still kill just as effectively. It's sort of like how, I mean, even today, the U.S. Army will dust off some old M14s if they have a shortage of M4s or M16s. Um, so, a lot of second-tier units, um, logistics units, and the like were equipped with uh, smoothbore muskets because they got the job done well enough for what they were doing. Um, it's also why even though they had repeating firearms during the Civil War in the form of the, uh, the Henry rifle and uh, some early Winchester prototypes, um, the Army adopted the trapdoor Springfield. Also, yes. Um, but the Army uh, adopted trapdoor Springfield after the war because that's what they could afford, and it's what they could outfit a large number of men with. Um, because the repeating guns were expensive. They were okay for civilians to be able to purchase, but um, outfitting an entire army with them would have been prohibitively expensive. Um, some cavalry units would use them, but if we're talking widespread infantry use, it's got to be something cheap and easy to use. Uh, that you have a lot of ammo for. But uh, back to Russia for a moment. 
where we're at right now, uh, slowly expanding into Siberia, and the bo our borders are starting to look a little bit like modern Russia. Um, Nogai absorbed some of Kazan, and Circassia lost badly. Which is fine, because I'm just going to probably go to war with the Great Horde next. Alright, we got separatists up here coming, so... I will take that, and... Yeah, we are still behind on a lot of things, because our monarch really sucks. But, let's pay for some advisors. I should probably change focus to Diplo. Alright, that should fix things. Once I core that stuff, I should probably be able to uh, bump one of those advisors up a level. That Commonwealth is looking pretty thick. Are they still friends with France? They are. That's still a problem. Uh, no allies I can get at them through either. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. Um, it, that war was such a mess for a lot of reasons. Um... To this day, it was responsible for... I could attack the Danes. They are pretty soft, and that is probably what I'll do. But I want to core what I have and put down these rebels first. But uh, even to this day, the Civil War is responsible for... I think World War II they might have gotten overtaken, but Gettysburg, uh, the Gettysburg remained the bloodiest battle in U.S. military history until World War I. That's what I'm going to do. And then uh, Antietam is still the bloodiest day, the bloodiest single day in U.S. military history. And I actually have been to that battle battlefield. It's in it's in Maryland. Um, worth a visit to the state to see. Um, around Christmas time, they actually, uh, they will light a single candle for everybody who died on the battlefield that day. Yes, that's what I was thinking of. Uh, U.S. history was not my specialty, but I did have a very good friend who was an Americanist. Um... Typically for me, the older, the better, too. Uh, yeah, I'll lose. I don't really want to go out there and fight rebels. Um, once you start getting past the uh, 18th century, my, my knowledge starts to drop off considerably, with the exceptions of World War One and World War II. The medieval era, both in Europe and in Asia is really my wheelhouse. Though I do have a weirdly specific knowledge set on the Korean War, because I wrote both of my, uh, both of my papers for undergrad on it. You know, where I went, you had to write two basically full-length research papers I believe the page limits were 25 for the junior year paper and 30 for the senior year paper. Um, and I wrote them both in the Korean War because I was able to reuse a lot of the same sources. Uh, the first one was a military analysis of the war. The second one... Oh, <laughs> those mobile strategy game ads are something else. 
Um, the only game I'm aware of where you can make that happen would be, like, Civilization. Which is a lot of fun, but not particularly historical. I need that legitimacy. Should be able to expand the army as well. Yep. How many streltsy can I get? All right. Yeah, I went, uh, my, my, my college was very good for history. I, um, yeah, uh, Paradox, I'd say, is like a real-time hybrid. Um, I like that you can pause it, but it's, and it's, uh, like, Age of Empires is, like, full real-time, something like that, but... Uh, Paradox is nice, cause I do like the ability to pause and think through what I'm doing. That is, I did, um, I did consider becoming a professor, actually. But I talked to one of my favorite professors, um, Dr. Gadotti. She was, she was awesome. Uh, she was a special, well, she is, she is a specialist on... The ancient Middle East, although she would, she wouldn't like that I use that term. Um, in her uh, line of study, it, it's it's the Near East, not the Middle East. But um, she studied that and the Greco-Roman world. And when I was coming into my senior year, I uh, I asked, I, I sat down and talked with her, and asked her about the process of becoming a PhD. And she was honest with me, and I love that she was honest with me. She said that I would make a great professor, but that she personally thought it was completely irresponsible the sheer number of uh, PhDs American universities are turning out. That there just is not enough work for them anywhere. And that was what really made me decide not to. Um because I didn't want to go to school for another five to ten years and not be able to get a job when I got out. Not be able to get a professorship when I got out. Because there just aren't enough of them. Um, that ultimately is what led me to doing this podcast. Because I can, I, I can still teach history, just not in a conventional way. Um... But no, she was great, and she was she was just one of many great professors I had. Um, there was a, I also had a professor who uh, oftentimes would play Pokemon during his office hours. He was great. I had him for Japanese history, Doctor uh, Heinz Eric Ropers. We were also one of the few history programs that had uh, a South America specialty, which I, I didn't know there was such a thing. But no, um, one of the, actually our best professors was a specialty, a specialist on South America. Which uh, fun fact: South America is the world's most peaceful continent in terms of number of wars it's had. Uh, I think it depends on the college you go to. Um, some of the institutions that are very focused on research, the professors are probably going to be more focused on that than they are teaching. But where I went, it, it was decidedly a school that was very focused on teaching. Um, and that, that was why Dr. Gadotti went there. She, she probably could have gotten paid a lot more money to go to uh, some other like, big research institution, but she wanted to teach. That was what she wanted to do. 
and she cared. Um, cared so much that she gave a bunch of people a, a, a language lesson <laughs> because the grammar we were, that a lot of the class was using on their papers was so horrible. Um, and she, she had no sympathy for people who couldn't even speak their own language right because she taught herself uh, German, French, and English, and she was fluent in all of them, plus her native Italian, and she also spoke some ancient Egyptian. That is bad. Um, that is bad that you couldn't even name, like, a, like, a Argentina or Brazil or, like, the big ones. I, I get if you might maybe forget some of the smaller ones. Everyone does. But to, f to not be able to name, like, a, like, and Brazil has a pretty major player throughout history, especially in that region. Um, that is that is concerning. And we can get Austria in as an ally. Common uh, Commonwealth is the defender, but they won't help Denmark. All right, that works fine for us. Hmm. That's good, but uh, no, I uh, uh, protect our trade. I don't care what Mecklenburg thinks. A lot of my best professor, best teachers and professors throughout my whole of uh, whole of school were history. Um, ah, sorry. I do have a tendency to repeat myself. Um, a lot of historians do. When I went back and read through one of those papers, there were a few uh, a few terms I use excessively. <laughs> and uh, what, what I do for work now, I, uh, I'm writing constantly, so I need to be on the lookout for that. Um, that's that's what for that's what that's what copy editors are for though. But anyway, yeah, some of the best best teachers I've had throughout my entire life have been history that uh that professor the teacher who um whose parents grew up in Mussolini's Italy he was a uh, the most complicated history a period of history that that is a tough one um hundred years war is an option and the whole medieval era is is a shit show more broadly um Hmm. I would say the early medieval period. It is a, I, I did my first uh, podcast series on it. So the early medieval period is... I, I usually classify it as 476 to 1066 or 1071. You can make the argument for either being the cutoff for the high medieval era. But... All of the politics are very personal and very small scale. Yes, so the immediate fallout of the Roman Empire is what's usually called the early medieval period. And it largely covers the Frankish Empire, Anglo-Saxon England, stuff like that. But you see all these atomized nations and tiny political bodies who are fighting with each other constantly, who are marrying each other constantly and who all have very confusing names. So, I, I say you could use either, because the end of Anglo-Saxon England is 1066, but 1071 is the Byzantine loss at the Battle of Manzikert, which can also be seen, I think, as the start of the er High Medieval Era, because I usually associate the High Medieval Era with the Crusades, and the cause of the Crusades was the Seljuk conquest of Anatolia. So, and because they happen so close together, like, if the Seljuks conquered Anatolia in the early 12th century, or, yeah, the early 12th century, uh, I wouldn't, 
but because they happened within four years, five years of each other, I consider them sort of two potential end dates for early medieval Europe. Just like you could consider the end of the Hundred Years' War and the fall of Constantinople both as the beginning of the early modern period. But you, in the fall of Rome, uh, well, the aftermath of Rome, you also have the rise of Islam, which adds a whole new layer of complexity to the situation. Um, it, 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 if you go, if you listen to, self, shameless self-plug, but if you listen to my first series, which was called From the Ashes of Empires, I go into full detail on this. Um, I cover everything from the very end of the Roman Empire to sort of the dawn of the High Medieval Era. And actually, this current series that I'm working on uh, is going to end right when that series started, really. Uh, I'm going to be ending this series early, fifth cent early 6th century. Yeah, that is... That, that is a funny coincidence of the era, is that it it begins and ends with Rome. <laughs> well, you, I mean, you can kind of argue that all of Western his, history begins with Rome, and it ends with Rome, maybe. But, um, yes, the uh, 476 is usually the hard date given, but you could, ar you could also argue that the early medieval period started a little bit earlier than that, because a lot of the institutions of the medieval era show up as early as the third century in Rome. The in Rome, what you see happening is in the crisis of the third century, which is the subject of my next two episodes. What you see happening is constant invasion from the Germans and the Persians, and this forces a lot of small Roman landowners to abandon their their the farms and go to major landholders for protection. So they labor in return for protection, and they effectively become serfs. Yeah, that was late Rome. Late Rome, they became feudal during the crisis of the 3rd century, um, or at least the beginnings of it. Because earlier in Rome's history, most of the farmers were fairly small scale, and big landholders, they were a thing, but they weren't... They didn't loom over all of Roman society. They didn't have huge amounts of serfs working for them. But what you see during the chaos of the 3rd century is the, uh, the sort of feudalization of Europe, because they flee the Germans and the Persians and group under the protection of these major landholders. And actually, a lot of those major landholders just married into the families of the invading Germanic groups. So some of the Roman bloodlines survived through the lines of Charlemagne and the like. So you can argue that the medieval era starts a little bit earlier than it did historically. Um, and part of the reason the Byzantine Empire survives is that it doesn't feudalize, at least not to the degree that Western Rome did. And small landholders remain the main sort of farming unit in, in, in Byzantium. Where did I lose? Okay, there we go. But uh, that, that is the subject of the next two episodes. So I'm, I'm kind of reformulating what I'm doing in those next two. So episode three is going to cover the, uh, the crisis of the third century from Rome's perspective. Talking about the big changes that were undergoing. Uh, Charlemagne maybe killed his brother. We don't know. And it's difficult to say exactly what happened there. But... When their father died, the empire was split between Charlemagne and his brother uh, Carloman, 
and a few years later, uh, Carloman dies, and Charlemagne inherits the whole empire. Um, actually, if you read, if you go back to the old sources, uh, Carloman might have uh, might have been in part assassinated by his own mother, who very much favored Charlemagne. And yeah, he just kind of he dies, and pretty much vanishes from history. Uh, and Charlemagne didn't go and kill Carloman's offspring. He wasn't that brutal. But he did banish them to a monastery to make sure they couldn't inherit. And Charlemagne... Charlemagne got around. Um, in his life, he had... I, it's been a while since I've studied him. He had something in the ballpark of eight or nine children, and God knows how many bastards, to the point where pretty much every major European noble family can trace their descent to Charlemagne at some point. And if you have any amount of Western European DNA in you, there's a decent chance you're, a rela you're, you're related to Charlemagne. Uh, yeah, it usually was, but it was a common practice to keep inheritances together, and it, it happens a lot uh, with uh, well, with women too. Actually, a lot of women were sent into the monastery or into the nunnery um, against their will during the medieval era. Uh, with men, though, it was usually just a common way of getting rid of potential rivals. Um, but for women, it was usually a way of getting rid of daughters you couldn't marry off. You couldn't really get anything out of, so they weren't a drain on the household resources. And you do have accounts of nuns fleeing nunneries, like jumping over the wall to try to get out. Yeah, there, there are. It was, it was, <laughs> it was a bad practice, all things considered. Yeah, yeah. Uh, if if you think modern parents are bad, uh, at least they're not throwing you in the nunnery. <laughs> Um, and, and, and honestly, it was preferable to what they did in Byzantium. In Byzantium, the common practice to deal with uh, male political rivals was castration and or blinding, sometimes both. So I would rather uh, end up in a monastery than be gelded. <laughs> Thing is, the way the Byzantines saw it, that was the uh, more merciful way of dealing with your political enemies. Eh, kind of, but at least it's not literal. <laughs> And I need to deal with the Danes in my south. Thing is, I still have boatloads of manpower, so I'm fine. Uh, blind blinding was a common practice for your, uh, for. Uh, enemies in war to um, Basil the Bulgar Slayer uh, got his 
pretty metal nickname because in a battle with the Bulgars, um, he captured a few thousand of them. And he had his men go through one by one. And 99 of every 100 men had their, eye, had their eyes gouged out. The 100th man had one eye gouged out so he could lead the other, the other 99 home. I'll take that just to get them out of my hair. Also, yes. Um, well, I, I do. I have met a uh, Balkan specialist, and they are an interesting breed. Um, that region has always been a mess, and it probably will always be a mess. But a few generations earlier, the Bulgars had killed a Byzantine emperor and turned his skull into a drinking cup, so brutality was just kind of what people did back then. <laughs> It was, uh, his name was Crum, and he was, that, that's a good barbarian name. Yeah, yeah, I and mean, that's, that's part of why the breakup of Yugoslavia was as brutal as it was. You had centuries-old ethnic blood feuds getting worked out, and it didn't it didn't go well for anybody involved. All right, the Austrians are actually helping me out, which is nice. Uh, yes, actually, that might have been who he was named for. Uh, I don't know. I don't know how much history J.K. Rowling knew when she wrote that, but uh, Crum was a Bulgarian warlord, uh, roughly the eighth or ninth century, and he was one. He captured a Byzantine emperor in battle, had him killed, and then turned his skull into a drinking glass. which is pretty goddamn metal, all things considered. Not only do you beat a guy in battle, you literally drink out of his skull. Ah, uh, the Austrians have left me. Commonwealth is absolutely getting their asses handed to them by the Ottomans. Uh, probably not. Probably not. <laughs> um, but again, that, that might have been his namesake. Very nice. How'd you do that that quickly? 
Did you get Scotland in a union or vassalize them? Nice. Well done. I've never been particularly good at playing England. Uh, I'm usually better at Russia, but this war with Denmark is turning into a shit show quite rapidly. Also true, yeah, there is, uh, I think France has like half the ships you do as England at the start of the game. Very nice. Yeah, that uh, I might have to try that strategy. No, Denmark, we're doing this. I'm not walking away empty-handed from this shit show. That is really good. Uh, I think this is this is a this is about as this is one of the faster Russia formations I've managed. Yeah, breaks just breaks it yourself right the hell out of Europe. That's the best way to play England. Well, at least we're ahead in one technology group. This is kind of what happened, though, with these old school wars. They would drag on for years. Go in different phases. Countries would be at war for decades sometimes. Uh, I'm sure historical England would probably have agreed with you in that era. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to get to a point where I can comfortably take those with war score.
And that would probably help me the next time I have to fight Denmark. Let's see what I can get for 25% and them being at very low war enthusiasm. I'm going to stick it out a little while longer. I've almost got them. Uh, it'll be some border gore, but I'll take it. Also, yeah. Um, you don't want to move your capital to St. Petersburg until you have uh, given yourself a bit of a buffer land-wise and built up a few ships. But at least we are touching the Baltic now have some coastal provinces. That also gave us some good exposure to institutions. I'll deal with these rebels and yeah. These loans, I should probably focus on paying those back. How many do I have? That's not terrible. Okay, once I've put these rebels down, should... yeah, I'm almost, almost about to tech up. Yeah, no, that's, you get free development for that, and you get a lot more trade power. Colonization of Siberia is going very nicely. My legitimacy got stupidly low. Yeah, that uh, the fort placement they give you at the start of the game is not ideal. Uh, I should, unless they have a decently sized buffer state. Looks like Mongolia might be getting a bit in my way. I'll take institution spread, that should help. Going to need to reorganize the army a little bit, I think. Uh, 
Alright, and those two should go back to normal on their own. Take religious wars, that'll be good for me. What is my standing? On the bottom of the great powers, but mostly because I am behind. on technology. Turn off my forts, save some money. You guys get over there. Hmm. Screw it, I'll go in more debt. That's fine. It's fine. Debt's just a number. Just like aggressive expansion. Let's get over there. Yes, once I have some money available, I will be doing just that. Especially if you if you build them on fur manufact uh, fur provinces as Russia, you will be rolling in money by the late game. All right, let the Holy Church be. Oh, part of the reason I'm losing money is I'm converting. I know. Um, I don't know what's causing that. Um, it's been that way ever since I switched to this new computer. Um, I should I should look into that. I can more or less figure out what's going on up there, but it's not ideal. I can probably stand to delete a few of these forts as well. Yeah, no, I Ireland can be pretty useful. Uh, difficult to develop, but the land itself has some useful goods in it. I mean, it really was the, the breadbasket of the British Empire. Um, if you go to Ireland today, you can see some of that. The farmland in and around Dublin is beautiful and extremely fertile. Um, but if you go out west, it's terrible farmland. It's very craggy and rocky. Um, yeah, it does. Um, it's beautiful, though. Um, Connemara and Western Ireland is... It's some place that you need to see before you die. It is quite simply gorgeous. Uh, I'll take that printing press support, thank you. Almost able to start paying some of these off. More free land, thank you. 
These provinces are almost ready. See, I played on some of the older patches where you had to take um, the colonization idea groups as Russia, and they were such a pain in the ass back then. That is the weird... Spain, for whatever reason, seems to always take South Africa. Historically, it was the Netherlands that did that, but it's it's weird that they... Spain never focused on Africa historically. So I don't know why Paradox has made the AI focus so heavily on it. We are getting pretty close to the Pacific now. And almost got this. I know, it's it's the weirdest thing. Um, I think it's because there are so many natives there. Um, the AI determines that it's not worth their time to fight them all. Which is kind of stupid, because they usually have a huge tech advantage on them. And Spain gets free claims through their ideas and everything as well. Uh, it's, the colonization in this game can be pretty darn weird. So I usually um, see Great Britain ignoring the Americas, which is kind of funny. But because of that, I I don't think I've ever seen the U.S. form from England. I've seen the U.S. form from Spain, which is weird. Um, every once in a while you'll see it happen, but it's almost never from an English America. Let's see if we can get... It looks like Spain is going for Colombia, but I... Well, it looks like they are getting uh, Mexico this game. And it looks like England has most of North America, but it looks like Spain is trying to sneak in. But Portugal grabbed the Caribbean. <laughs> uh, it does. Maritime can be worth it if you are a naval power. Uh, I don't think I've ever taken the idea group, though. Um, usually I'll go for trade first. Alright, that's all rebels dealt with for a little while. Well, almost all of them. boost my stability. Hopefully that'll help. And back to colonization. I know, they never, Portugal never takes Brazil. It's the weirdest thing. Uh, Russia, the, the only thing about Russia and these new ideas is you're completely disincentivized from taking the actual colonization idea groups, so you almost never have cause to take Russia, or to take Alaska. Might have to uh, play around with those. Uh, yeah, there are some idea groups in this game that I've never actually messed around with too much. Like, uh, I just took espionage in my personal uh, Brandenburg game uh, because they moved the uh, state propaganda from influence to espionage. Uh, I don't like it, but... The aggressive expansion reduction is extremely useful if you're playing in the HRE.
It is wild that Spain, uh, France still hasn't managed to deal with England. I have seen a few mods that do that. Uh, I haven't been able to get any of them to work with my rig, but uh, I'm, I'm always on the lookout for mods that make it a bit more historical. Because usually Portugal grabs Alaska, which is which is my personal favorite. Um, I've I've seen Portuguese Alaska more times than I can count. Fun fact, Lake Baikal out here is the world's largest freshwater lake in terms of volume. Not in terms of width, but in terms of it's It's extremely deep. Uh, also, yeah, no, Portuguese Alaska. I see it all the time. I don't know why, but for whatever reason, Portugal feels the need to grab that and California all the time in my games. No, oh. <laughs> uh, I I I think I'm in the extreme minority here, but I do like playing in the late game. I think I've seen the U.S. form like once or twice, but it always happens late game. I know, it is weird. Um, they didn't even focus on Brazil much throughout history. They only really start worrying about Brazil when the French decided they wanted it. And Portugal was like, uh, guys can go right to hell. That's That's our clay. We claimed it centuries ago. But no, they really had limited colonies right along the coast, and they were just harvesting some of the wood. And that was really the extent of it for most of early Portuguese colonial history. Um, the funny thing about it, though, is um, Portugal could never in a million years militarily force France to leave. They just paid him to, because Portugal was absurdly rich at the time, and it's sort of the birth of the, uh, I'm gonna give you a hundred bucks to fuck off right now meme. That's basically what it was. Portugal was like, hey, France, I will literally pay you to fuck right off. They did, um... Which only really uh, Spain and Portugal actually did. Um, but I, I don't think any of the European countries had any real need to. I mean, especially once Protestantism broke out. Why were you going to... Why was an England or a Netherlands going to listen to the Pope, of all people? Actually, speaking of the uh, Iberian colonial powers, I'm reminded of one of my favorite phrases I've ever heard, which is, uh, <laughs> making money is comes as naturally to a Dutchman as burning witches comes to a Spaniard. <laughs> Some of the, uh, the anti-Catholic propaganda that the Dutch put out while they were rebelling. They're slowly catching up. Slowly. You kind of got to get used to being behind in tech as Russia. It feels it feels bad, but eh, you got the manpower to fight. <laughs> I 
Uh, it, it is difficult for us to imagine today, but back in the day, um, think about it. Their lives were considerably shorter than ours are today. Um, you're, you're, if, if, you, if you only had a good chance to live into like 60, 50 uh, for a lot of people, uh, you, you might care a bit more about the, uh, the, oh yeah, no, I, uh, I'd like to just, um, that's all I do with them while they're idling, is I'll get some professionalization. Uh, if, if I'm not doing anything with the army, that's what I'm doing. Uh, when you get to the late game, it can be very helpful if you, if you invest the time to do that early on, um, you get a enormous army that can siege down provinces very quickly. So, late game, you can just swarm other countries and take out all their forts along the border really quickly. Okay, now we're getting the printing press. So, while I'm waiting for that truce to expire... Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, but so while I'm waiting for that truce to expire, my next focus is going to be expanding down and swallowing up the entirety of the Volga. Now, interesting fact about the uh, the Russians, or where, where the name Russia originates, it comes from the old Finnish word for the Vikings, or at least the Vikings who came eastward. Uh, they referred to them as the Rus, which means the men who row, because before the rise of, like, Russia as we know it, um, there weren't really no road networks, or definitely no railroads, so this massive river network the, uh, the the Volga, the the Nip, and a few others were Russia's ancient Russia's super highway system. That was the only way you were getting across that vast territory quickly. So that's what they used, and so the Finns started calling them the men who row because they would take rowboats up and down these rivers. And actually, during that era, we get one of my personal favorite. Uh, women in history, who was Olga of Kiev, who is now a saint. And this woman puts uh, Khaleesi to shame. Ru Game of Thrones has nothing on Russian history. So, she uh, she loved her... She was married to the uh, Grand Prince of the Kievan Rus. And she loved her husband, Igor, dearly. They, they had one son together. Uh, I believe his name was Vladislav. Anyway... So, a group of people called the Drevlians murdered her husband. So, what does she do in response? She, uh... So, well... Yes, that is exactly what she did. But the build-up to that was so incredibly brutal. Um, so, the prince of the Drevlians, his name was Mal, and he wanted to marry Olga, which is... For the record, murdering the husband of the woman you want to flirt with is a pretty goddamn bold move, as far as I'm concerned. Um, it's a bold strategy, and it did not work out for Prince Mal. So, Olga, she responds to his marriage proposal. Uh, a bunch of dudes come to try to get her to marry Prince Mal. And she literally locks them inside a bathhouse sets it on fire, and kills them all. And then she says, uh, send a bigger party of people, because that was not enough befitting my station. And being an idiot, Prince Mal did send an even larger retinue, and Olga parades them through the streets of Kiev. It is 1594. Um, and Olga parades them through the streets of Kiev. Um, and they're, they're on these giant uh, wooden boats that she's had constructed specifically for the occasion. So, it's all going great. And then, all of a sudden, 
the people carrying these boats tip them over into a giant ditch Olga had had dug on the outskirts of Kiev, and her men began burying them alive. Uh, I knew about her before, but his video is really good. Um, so she, she buried these motherfuckers alive, uh, and then rides ahead and said she was so excited to marry Prince Mal, she just had to get ahead of him. And then she does her own red wedding, um... They're having this big wedding feast, uh, or funeral feast, right? And she orders her men not to drink anything. Meanwhile, the Drevlians are all getting absolutely shithoused. So, right as all of the Drevlians are completely blitzed, um, she has her men draw their swords and kill every last one of them. They're too drunk to fight. And then she flees the city, and at this point her army has arrived, and she besieges it. So... She says she'll leave the city alone if every single one of the people in the city bring her a swallow and a pigeon. I think I got the birds right. Anyway, so she gets them. And this is actually an old Viking trick that Harold Hardrada used on the Arabs in Sicily. Um, they tied burning sulfur to the birds' feet and flew them back into the city. And they lit it all on fire. And Olga had her men waiting at every single entrance to the city. And... All of the civilians were either killed or sold into slavery. And then she actually remains a very big part of her son's reign throughout his time on the throne. Uh, he, he converted. He, for most of his life, he was a pagan. Um, he was born in Norway, part of the royal family, had to flee when one of his relatives seized the throne. Um, he went to the Kievan Rus, and he originally wanted to marry the daughter of the prince of the Rus, but he did not consider Harald Hodrada an adequate husband for his daughter. So, Harald goes down to Byzantium, to make a fortune for himself in the Varangian Guard, which is something that was a pretty common practice for a lot of young Viking men with relatively limited prospects back in the day. So while he's down there, he amasses a huge amount of money by being a murderous badass. Um, one of my favorite stories about Harald Hardrada was uh, he, he was arrested for quote-unquote debauching a noblewoman, um, which is a gloriously vague description of what he actually did. No one knows. Um, but as punishment, he was thrown into a pit of lions. Well, come the next morning, the soldiers come to pull him out of the pit, and they find that he had strangled the lions to death. So these two hapless Roman guards didn't do anything, because are you going to pick a fight with a guy who just killed several lions with his goddamn bare hands? I know I wouldn't. Um, and then he was later imprisoned uh, in another weird political plot, um, but during a riot in the city, he broke out, and he, he crushed the emperor's skull between his own hands, like the mountain style in Game of Thrones, crushed his head, and then... Um, he and his men left for Nor left for the, the Rus to collect the money he'd been sending back there. He's now officially a good enough husband for his his, his for uh, the prince's daughter. He marries her, and that's when he converts to Christianity because she was a Christian, and that's also when Norway converts to Christianity. There were Christians in Norway at that point, but they were not the dominant religion. But after the new king becomes Christian, so too does Norway. And that's also when a lot of Oslo gets built up, because uh, Harald Hardrada wanted the city to be a Constantinople of his own in the north. So he builds up a lot of what made Oslo into a major city. And then he goes to England to try to conquer it, and then he dies. He takes an arrow to the eye. So, 
In short, yes, he was, but only near the end of his life. Sort of like a Constantine-style conversion, not on his deathbed, but he was no spring chicken, and I cannot fight them yet. Uh, yeah, so not on his deathbed, but not a young man either when he converted. Oh, sorry, I got that confused. Um, Harald Hodrada also died by arrows. Um, it has been about two years since I've studied this. Um, in between the uh, first and second series, I tried to do... I actually did, did start a Russian history series, but I was starting a new job at the time and just did not have the time for both the podcast and that. Um, I would like to return to it eventually, but uh, that's not for... not until I'm done with the Rome series, at least. Um, so... This series will go until the very end of 2021. Man, I might return to Russia. I might do something different. I don't know. Um, so there's half of a Russia series up there uh, that you can go see in my, my episode backlog. And then I also have the entire first series, which is 16 episodes long. And the, th the third two and a half series is uh, on the Crusades, and that's eight episodes long. And that covers everything from sort of a primer on what led up to the Crusades to the fall of Constantinople. Um, because I honestly think the Crusades are one of those things that we have... Also, yes, arrows, arrows are England's greatest strength and England's greatest weakness. Actually, it was it was a very interesting piece of early surgery at uh, at Agincourt, or at, it wasn't Agincourt, but it was during the Hundred Years' War. Henry the Fourth or Fifth took an arrow roughly here on his jaw, and it was way deep in his skull, and they were they didn't want it to get infected. So, the royal surgeon sent for a blacksmith to make him a a very specific piece of equipment on on demand, and they managed to pull the arrowhead out of his skull and he wound up living into like his 60s or 70s. Um, but the second series, anyway, the Crusades is one of those things where I think we have a lot of trouble understanding them these days because religion is not nearly as prevalent in most of our lives as it was for them. So I think we have a very difficult under time understanding what motive it what motivated them to do what they did. And, eh, given the modern political situation, the Crusades are heavily politicized, and it contributes to them not being very well understood. <laughs> Most people think they know the Crusades, but they don't. Because the modern education system... It's very bad at teaching history, and it's very bad, very, very bad at teaching medieval history. Yes, it was it was that, but I think a lot of people have trouble wrapping their heads around just how deeply the people who fought the Crusades on both sides thought that. And people too often, I think, they they get it in their heads that one side was evil, one side was good, and whoever that was really depends on your perspective. But in that series, I really argue that there weren't really any good guys or bad guys, at least throughout the whole thing. There were good Christians and good Muslims, bad Christians and bad Muslims. It was a very complex phenomena that is not very well understood. And it's a shame, because it is very, a very interesting period in history, and you get this interesting cultural fusion uh, between... France and uh, uh, and and the East uh, going on in in Outremer, which is what they called the Crusader states. You also get some very interesting and heroic figures like Richard the Lionheart and Saladin. At true that that is that is definitely a way to look at it, but you do have acts of heroism and pure just brass balls like um in the First Crusade. Oh, you bastards! 
well, the Danes have gone to war with me. The pricks. That is like one of the worst sounds in the world, is the, uh, the EU4 war noise. Um, but in the First Crusade, Bowman of Toronto has this really epic moment during the siege of Antioch where he leads a couple hundred cavalry to victory over several thousand Muslims at once. It was incredible. Um, it was the original, like, Leroy Jenkins kind of thing. He just says, fuck it, we're charging. And they won which they shouldn't have, but they did. Because Bowman of Toronto did not give a single fuck. At least this time, I only really have to worry about them coming from one direction. Alright, more loans. Let's go. <laughs> we do. Those, those heathen Danes don't stand a chance. I need to tech up very badly. So let's focus on that. See, oh, we can get an army morale. That'll be good. Eh, six and one half dozen the other. They all deserve the stake anyway. <laughs> That's, that's the way you got to look at it in this time period. That is technically true. Yeah. Holy crap, what happened to my morale there? That, that is my low military tech biting me in the ass. Alright, get everybody together, we'll overwhelm them with manpower. That's what Russia does. Yes, they are. And we'll deal with them. But we got to deal with these, these Scandinavian jerks first. Uh, more than likely, yes. Uh, but I got to get everybody together if I have any hope of beating the Danes. At the very least, if I lose, it, I'm probably only going to lose a bit of the uh, the Baltic. Uh, if I can beat them, I will. This is a good opportunity to do that. I will have my men besiege Moscow, because we need to liberate that first if we want to win this.
But on that note, I think I'm going to call it for tonight. Um, I'm going to be doing a multiplayer stream with I'm Batman uh, 75028 on, uh, on Tuesday, right around 8 o'clock, I think. So tune in for that. Uh, it will not be the Russia game. I'll probably be playing a different country. Um, on that note, have a wonderful night, everybody. Renegade Historian, signing off.